Let's talk about Piri Piri Summoners, an upcoming game with giant hand-carved meeples. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about an upcoming game from Moku Omo, who've also come out with lots of stacking games, actually. There was Moku Tower and most recently Tawa, uh, is is a game that came my way from Kickstarter. This one is called Piri Piri Summoners. Now, Piri Piri Summoners is a game for between two and four players. Kids age eight and up can figure this one out, but it is still strategic, and games only take about half an hour to play. Let's take a deeper look at Piri Piri Summoners by Moku Omo. Piri Piri Summoners is a light game. It would be called a tile placement game, really, but we are placing cards. So the game itself is played with a deck of regular playing cards, 52 cards. There's a couple of jokers. There's The, the cards go from ace to king. Uh, and so it's a regular deck of playing cards. They do thankfully have a little symbol to remind you of some of the important gameplay elements for this game, but you could play poker or hearts or any other game. Uh, that any other regular card game that you want to with this deck of cards. You've also got, like I said, these hand-carved, hand-painted, giant animal meeples. So each player is going to be choosing one of these at the start of the game. You've got uh, a raccoon and a capybara uh, and a bunny and a little pig. Well, I say little, but these are quite large. These are some big meeples here. So each player is going to have one of these. Their little character is going to go on the cards that they play into what's going to become kind of a, a grid in front of them of cards. What your goal here in this game is to be the first one to summon these forest spirits. And the forest spirits are represented by face cards from the deck. So you've got four suits. You've, you're separating out before you play the game. You're separating out all the face cards from Jack to King. Uh, and these are the cards that you're going to be trying to play onto the board. Now it's possible that you might get to a point where nobody can play anymore. Nobody can summon these face cards uh, from their hand. And if the game ends, if everybody passes because they can't play anything, they're not going to be able to finish. Well, then you're going to have earned some victory points from the spirits that you did summon earlier in the game. So you're either trying to be the one with the most points, but if anyone is able to summon all three, you start the game with three of these cards, all three of their spirits, that person is automatically going to win and it's game over. So before you start playing, you've got the face cards all separated out. Each player is going to be dealt randomly. They're going to get three of these spirits that they have to summon. The jacks are the easiest one. All you need are two cards of the same suit as your jack have to be across from each other vertically or horizontally with one space in the middle. The space in the middle is where the jack is going to go. You'll get two points if you summon that jack. You get four points for summoning a, summoning a queen, but the queen needs three cards to be around it in a triangle, and that can be in any orientation. So you've got a little icon at the bottom of the card that shows what you need in order to summon it. In this case, it's the queen of diamonds. I need three diamonds to be surrounding a space in the middle where the queen's going to go. That's going to earn me four points. It's six points if you summon the king, but the king needs four cards to be all around it before he can come onto the board. Now, how do you play this game? Everybody starts in addition to their three spirits. You're going to start with four cards in your hand. Every turn you start with four cards, you finish with four cards. You've got a choice of what you can do on your turn. And the choices are you're either going to take a card from your hand, put it on the bottom of the deck and then grab another card, or you're going to draw a card and play it. Now you can draw a card from the deck and do a blind draw, or you can spend one of these little coins. These are mana coins to take a card that's face up in the marketplace. Um, and these mana coins are really important. You only start out with eight. In order to summon your spirit, you need to spend two of them. So if you've only got eight and you have to summon three, you're gonna be using six of these in order to win the game. Uh, and if the game ends early, you get one victory point for each one that's left over. So you've got to be really judicious in how you spend these things. You might, though, in this case, you can see that there's a joker uh, in the marketplace here that you could buy for a coin. 
The Joker is a very important card because it's it's one of the most powerful in the game. The Joker can be placed anywhere on the board as long as it's touching or adjacent to another card. The other card that has a superpower is the Ace. If you're lucky enough to get an Ace into your hand, the Ace can replace another card on the board, which is going to mess with the other players, I'm sure, or allow you to summon that spirit. So let's talk about how this game plays. Uh, you're going to start the game with your five cards in the marketplace. Those cards get replaced as they're purchased. There's going to be a card drawn at random that goes in the middle. This is the beginning of your forest where you're placing the cards. You start, as I said, with the four card hand. And if I've got those three cards like I showed you for the spirit, I've got a queen of diamonds, I've got a king of spades and a jack of hearts. Well, the jack is going to be an easy one to place. I do have a yellow ace that's going to begin to build up that pattern that I need in order to place it. But I do have three uh, cards here that would allow me to summon the queen of diamonds. And, and my queen is the queen of diamonds. So maybe I'm going to be thinking about those red cards and getting those red cards out. But of course, as you play the cards, the other players are going to have an idea what it is that you're trying to do. And they're going to try and mess with your plans. The way that you place cards is you're going to place them adjacent to another card that's on the board, but there are special rules in terms of where cards can go. You've got kind of a, an order of power here that's shown at the bottom of each of the cards. So blue is more powerful than red. Red is more powerful than green. Green is more powerful than yellow. Yellow is more powerful than blue. It kind of goes around the circle like that. And so I can place a card of a more powerful suit next to another card. So because red is the one, green is weak to red, I can place any number red card right beside that green. Maybe I want to place a lower number and save my higher number for later, uh, for example. So say I place my four here. If I've got a card that's in the weaker suit, so here next to green, the weaker card to green is a yellow. All I had was the yellow ace, but say I had a, a yellow 10. Because yellow is weak to green, I need to play a card that has a higher number on it in order to place it next to a green card. So you're either placing any number card in the more powerful suit. If it's the weaker suit, the number has to be higher. If it's the same, if it's green or the card that's opposite green is blue here, if it's a neutral suit, well, any card can be played. So in the neutral suit, any card can go beside that five. The other way that you can place any card you want is diagonally, it doesn't matter. The suit, the number doesn't matter. If I'm placing it diagonally, I'm good to go. So chances are, since I do have a red queen, I'm gonna to wanna to start placing those red cards but again, I might want to be strategic. Maybe I want to hang on to it until later. Maybe I want to see what the other player is going to do. Maybe I'm going to draw a card from the deck instead. But if, I, if I'm going to play a card, I draw a card from the deck and then I play a card. Could be the card that I drew. Could be a different card. In this case, I'm going to play the four. But because I've drawn one and I've played one, then I'm going to continue to have those four cards in my hand plus the face cards that I have to summon. Once you play a card, you're going to place your meeple on top of it to show that that's your card, that's the last one that you played. I've chosen the raccoon here because we often get raccoons in our yard trying to, not going through the garbage because I do have critter proof garbage cans, but we I do live in the country. So sometimes we do get some animals. Now the next player is going to play their card. Now red uh, is weak to blue, it's strong against green. So the, the next player is going to play in an effort to get their cards out there. If a, a card is surrounded by cards in the stronger suit. So if I had, say, a situation like this, where maybe the Capybara has managed to flank my red card with two blues that are the stronger power, well, that's going to make this card disappear. It's going to send my raccoon home. Well, and if that happens, then the player, the capybara player, is going to steal one of my mana coins from me. And now I've only got seven instead of eight. So this is another strategy in the game. You are trying to trap players. You're trying to flank cards that you know that they want so that you can get rid of them. You might be trying to use an ace to replace another card. If I could see that I might, there's a chance I'm going to get surrounded. 
Maybe I'm going to replace one of these cards with an ace. The ace has a different logo. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. That just shows it can go on top of any other card. So that's going to get rid of another card. If uh, the, the bunny was on top of that card and I played an ace there, well, the bunny's going to get sent home. I'm going to get to steal a coin, and then my little raccoon goes on top of the ace. So uh, you've always got to play a card next to or surrounding somehow a card that's already on the board eventually cards are going to start disappearing because either you've flanked it with two cards of the stronger suit or because you've managed to summon one of your spirit cards. How do you summon those spirits? Well in a situation like this one I can't summon yet but I did have that yellow ace earlier like I said and the ace can replace. So if I'm as the raccoon trying to play my yellow jack I just need to have two yellow cards that are opposite one another with a space in the middle. Well, I can do that with the ace because I can replace this card that has my little raccoon on it. Now I can play the jack. My raccoon moves over to the jack. All of these cards get burned in the summoning, so they're gone. Again, if another player had their meeple, their, their capybara, on a card that gets burned, that, car that character is going to get sent home. You're going to get to steal a coin. It does cost two coins to summon though, so I'm going to be spending two of these mana in order to play that jack, but it's also going to earn me two victory points, and typically you just use the face down mana to represent the victory points that you're earning along the way. What skills are you practicing though when you play a game like Peery Peery Summoners? Well, <laughs> it is a spatial game. You're thinking about how you want to lay things out in order to be able to summon those spirit cards that you have in your hand so that you can earn those points. The puzzle does get more complicated as you play and there's more cards in the tableau because you have to think about well is this card stronger or weaker? Or is it neutral? Do I need a higher number? Uh, can I play any number I want? There's lots of things to consider once the, the puzzle gets bigger and it's an ever-changing puzzle. So you are using those spatial problem solving skills in order to get your cards onto the board. You're also invoking the executive functioning skills. The executive functions are the skills and behaviors that you need to work towards a goal. And here you are budgeting your mana because you need those six mana to summon. You might be trying to plan ahead. Well, of course you have to plan ahead to get those cards, especially if you've got a king that needs four cards around it in order to be summoned. So you really are doing some planning there and thinking, how, okay, how am I going to get this in place without the other players seeing what I'm doing and ruining my plan? You might be trying to plan things out so that you can trap and flank another player so that you can steal their coins. That might prevent them. In fact, in some of the games we played, we were able to get one player down to one mana coin so they couldn't do any summoning until they flanked somebody else. And that's a really good strategy for this game. So you are kind of going, you know, back and forth, but you're thinking ahead to how am I going to do that summoning? There is some memory involvement here as well. Why is memory involved? Well, because you're watching what those other players are playing and you're trying to figure out, well, what are the spirit cards that they have that they're trying to summon? So if you see, oh, you know, the Capybara player is playing blue cards and red cards, well, there's something going on there. They want to summon something with blue or red. That might make it easier for you to start to mess with their plans or to make sure that you're get, grabbing the cards in the market that they might want. Um, or, you know, can you take advantage? Because if, if they're playing blue to get a blue king and I've got a blue jack, well, they're going to be helping me in my quest to summon those spirits. So uh, there, there is that memory uh, involvement too. And of course, the working memory of calculating out with your four cards, where can each one go? How do I want to lay those things out? Final thoughts about Piri Piri Summoners. Well, I say final thoughts, but this is a preview of a game that's going to, kit, that's going to hit uh, crowdfunding soon. So final thoughts about the version of the game that I have that may be different from the final, uh, the final game. So this is a prototype. But wow, these characters are a lot of fun. I mean, they're, they're hand carved and hand painted, so they're all going to be a little bit different. I'm not sure what that's going to do to the price point of this game, but um, these are great little meeples. And uh, I, I think like all of the Mokuomu games, the idea here is 
that you've got pieces of the game that could be used as a decoration in a kid's room or something like that. You know, these animals are a lot of fun. And I do have the, the blocks from Tawa and the, and the fancy carved wooden box from Tawa on the shelf on my game table. Um, so you've got the decoration element. You've got the, the really the art of these hand carved animals. Um, you've got the face cards here and the joker uh, in, in the deck of cards are fun as well. So the artwork is good. You've got gameplay where the rules are simple enough. Now in the first iteration of the rule book, and I know that's being kind of updated, there were a few things that were a little confusing that I wasn't sure about. I had to get in touch with the designers to ask some questions. That's going to be cleared up before the, the game finally comes out. So the rules are going to be simple. You just have to keep in your mind, like, which cards can you play where. Uh, this card is stronger, so it can be any number. This card is weaker, so it's got to be a higher number. Uh, anything goes if it's neutral or if you're playing diagonally. Those are fairly easy to remember once you play through a few rounds of the game. You're making that choice that I like, that choice between furthering your own plan and messing with the other player or taking a turn just to see what the other player does so that you can guess. What, what it is that they're working towards, or maybe take advantage of the cards that, that they're playing to further your own agenda of summoning your spirits. You've, you've got the budgeting of, and it is a tight budget with these little wooden mana coins. Oh man, uh, every time you spend one on a card in the market, you're kind of thinking to yourself, uh-oh, <laughs> should I have done that? I need to make sure I have enough coins to win the game. And if I get flanked, maybe if after I bought a couple of cards here, if I get flanked, well, I'm, I'm going to be in big trouble because I'm not going to have enough coins to win. Are there downsides, though, to Piri Piri Summoners? It is hard to say because this is, as I said, a prototype. The first draft that I saw of the rulebook was a little unclear about some things. I know that that's going to be fixed. I think it could be frustrating to be the player who draws, you know, if you draw two kings and a queen as the spirits that you have to summon, that's going to be much harder for you than the player who's got three jacks that they have to put out on the table. So you really are going to have to think ahead and be very careful with every single turn if you've got those high spirit cards. Now you could, you know, house rule it and kind of divide things up a little bit or handicap things so the younger kids are getting the jacks and the queens and the older players are getting the queens and the kings. You know, there's lots of ways that you can customize that, but I think that's the frustration, right? If I draw three kings, oh my gosh, what a pain that's going to be to play all of those cards onto the table. The other thing I'd say is that I, I know with these these handcrafted and hand-painted pieces that this is a game that's that's probably going to be a bit more expensive than other card games. I like that these this is a deck of cards that you can use to play other games too, my hope is that the final card quality is going to match up with the quality of everything else in the box. So it's hard to say with the prototype what the final cards are going to be like. But if you get, you know, super high quality playing cards in addition to these super high quality uh, carved pieces and the high quality art on those cards, man, this is going to be amazing. Uh, and, you know, you're going to want to play lots of card games with those high quality cards if they're able to do that. Uh, but meanwhile, you're going to have these little guys on the shelf because they're super cute. <laughs> and it's a nice little uh, work of craftsmanship, I would say. These little, and, and I really like the little pig. Of course, I picked the raccoon because we have some pet raccoons, I guess you might call them. The bunny, oh my gosh. Anyway, the, the quality of the pieces here is great. Thanks so much to the folks at Mokuomo for sending this game my way. If you have any questions, I'll put a link to the crowdfunding campaign in the show notes of the video as soon as I know what, where that project is going to be. You'll know about it in the show notes of the video. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions, you can leave them in the comment section below the video or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca. BrainsOnGames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go. The previous ones are up there already. Brains on Games is the Facebook page and the X handle and the Instagram feed, so we're all over the place. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones, you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye.